That's that. Uh, that's the way Indiana Jones ought to look. This is this is the this is the difference I was mentioning. They asked me what the difference was between the first movie and the second movie. The difference is I play Indiana Jones. When George and I were in Hawaii, and I agreed to direct Raiders. George said that if I did wind up directing the first one, that I would need to direct three of them. He said he had three stories in mind. It turned out George did not have three stories in mind. We had to make up all the other subsequent stories. So it was like two weeks after Raiders opened that we knew we were going to have to sit down in the room and figure out what Raiders 2 was going to be. This is Indiana Jones, a famous archaeologist. We started out ultimately with saying, well, we had all these sequences from Raiders that we couldn't fit in there. Raiders of the Lost Ark was too super packed with gags and stunts and set pieces. It's just, it's just no movie could hold that much. So certain things carried over, and I always remembered the river rafting scene, which we had written for Raiders, which I saved and took kind of bookmarked for a, another Raiders movie. That went into Temple of Doom. And then we had an entire minecart chase, like a, like a roller coaster ride. Um, that was originally written for Raiders. And so I basically just took it out of Raiders and kept it in a drawer, and then when it came time to figure out set pieces for Temple of Doom, we dusted it off and stuck it in the end of Temple of Doom. So we took a lot of the good sequences from Raiders and put it in there and then fit the story around it. And this time we hired some writers that I'd worked with on American Graffiti, Bill and Gloria Hike. George knew about our interest in India. We had traveled in India and we were uh, collecting Indian art and so forth, and said that he, he and Stephen had decided to set the next in, the, in, in India, and uh, I think that's why he came to us, because he knew we were interested in the country and had some knowledge of it. And uh, George had one main idea. He said, look, it's going to be a very, very dark film. The way Empire Strikes Back was the dark second act of this first trilogy, he wanted the second indie film to be much darker. So George came up with this idea that it was going to be about the Kali cult and it have a lot to do with black magic. And I had never done anything like that before, so I kind of kept nodding my head, well, if you guys think that's, that's a good idea, sure, I'll go along with it. The story ended up, for whatever reason, uh, turned a lot darker, I think. We decided to go darker. Uh, part of it, I guess, was I was going through a divorce at the time, and I wasn't in a good mood. And part of it was just, you know, we wanted to do something a little bit more edgy. Harrison really got into even better shape because he had to have his shirt off for much of the time. So Harrison did a lot of weight training and, and aerobic training, and he just got himself into peak condition. That's it, camera. Aren't you going to introduce us? I looked at a lot of possible indie girls. This is Willie Scott. I really wanted to bring Marion back, but George and I discussed it and thought there should be a different Indiana Jones lady in each of the different films. So we started looking for a nightclub singer named Willie Scott. Willie was named after my dog, by the way, because since Indy was named after George's dog, Indiana, and I had a dog named Willie, and then Short Round was the name of Bill and Gloria's dog. So Key was called Short Round. So in that sense, all three characters were named after our house pets. I got a phone call from my agent saying the sequel to Raiders of the Lost Ark is being cast, and um, they would love to meet you. And that's not my kind of movie. I was, not, I was looking at foreign films, and I was looking at little art films, and you know, being very serious actor studying in Manhattan. But while I said I didn't want to do this movie, of course, I did very much want to do this movie because if I did a movie like this, it would certainly elevate my opportunities to, to do more movies, and that's really what I wanted to do, was just as many movies as I could. So I prepared and I brought in a lot of props. I like to keep busy because that's one way for me to stay calm and not get too nervous. Now, just when my career is starting to pay off, you come along. You stick a knife in my dress, Paris original. I'm in the first ever gunfight with real goddamn bullets, and then you crash an airplane. You crash an airplane. You call yourself a doctor. And I thought she was absolutely willy. Uh, she wasn't spoiled, and she wasn't that character in real life, but I mean, she had the energy to play that girl. I remember taking the tape over to Harrison's house that night and saying, look, I've got about 15, 20 girls on tape. I only want to show you one. And I put Kate in. No second choices for Harrison. He said, she's the one. And that's how Kate got cast. George's idea was to start the movie with a musical. He wanted to start the whole film with a Busby Berkeley dance number 
where Willie Scott comes out singing some song. George didn't know what song, but that was George's contribution to the opening teaser and all of his story beats. He said, why don't we start this movie with a musical number? He said, hey, Stephen, you're already saying you always want to shoot musicals. You're a frustrated musical director. I said, yeah, that'll be fun. So we hired Danny Daniels, a choreographer, and put together this crazy number based on Anything Goes. They're supposed to reveal the same Okay, time. this side was late revealing. That side was early. Okay, time. girls. And Kate had to, A, learn the entire song in, in Mandarin, number one, and then learn all the choreography. And luckily, what I didn't know about Kate was she could also sing and dance. She has a great voice, and she's a wonderful dancer. So Mr. Spielberg, how does it feel directing a musical? Well, it feels just, just swell. And just how swell. That was an actress's dream come true, singing, dancing, costumes. But we got the dress on, that little red number, and it fit like a glove. And so I couldn't dance. I didn't get to do the dance number. So all the tapping that I had done, oh, it was heartbreaking. So I did a little this. That's, I don't know what, the, I'm speechless, you know what I mean? I feel like, I feel like this you is wanna 19. Go to, you want to go to the prom? Yes. You want to go to prom with me? Kate Capshaw had to wear this glamorous sequin dress, which I had made by Barbara Matera in New York. And it was completely made of original 1920s and 1930s beads and sequins, which Barbara had been collecting for years and years and years. But this meant that there was only enough stuff to make one dress. Uh, but this didn't seem to be a problem because the dress was only used in the script, was only used in this one sequence. And then, of course, the whole schedule was rearranged. And this sequence was going to be shot instead of shooting it first before we went to Sri Lanka. It was the last thing we shot when we came back from Sri Lanka. But the crunch point came when we were night shooting and uh, it was a scene with Harrison and, and Kate and they were sitting by a little campfire and the dress was hung over the branch of a tree behind them and they were shooting the scene and I looked over and an elephant was calmly eating the whole back out of the dress and the whole back was, was, was eaten out of the dress. So when we came back to England to, to shoot the scene where Kate had to look smashing in this very, very expensive dress, Barbara Matera, who'd made the dress, had to be brought first class British Airways over from New York and installed in a suite at the Ritz Hotel with the, the, the few pots of beads and sequins that remain to repair the dress. And of course, it was me that had to sign the insurance claim and it said reason for damage. Um, and, and what could I put? All I could put was dress eaten by elephant. I hate that elephant. I didn't know how to scream. That was the first thing. I did not know how to scream. By the way, I, you know, I didn't read all that either. And then she screams, and then she screams, hello, can she do anything else besides scream? The biggest trouble with her is the noise. A running joke on the film that, of course, later really got us. But I couldn't scream. And so Stephen taught me how to scream. This would be a, a great scream. scream. Ready? Here, here it goes. On three. Eyes you open. count to three. Okay. One, two, three. <laughs> now, they'll, they'll loop me later. They'll dub it a great scream. It'll be a great scream. Put your Fay Ray from King Kong. That's the best scream I've ever heard. I mean, you know, it's. Screaming is not as easy as it looks. Wow, holy smoke, crash landing. I was 12 years old when I auditioned for this uh, part. And uh, basically, they had an open call at my elementary school. And all the kids that fitted the description would call into the room to meet this casting director. Key was truly remarkable and quite unique. And when we did the open call, he actually didn't show up to do the interview. He brought his brother. And the entire time that he was trying to tell his brother what to do, we kept looking at him and finally said, you know, who is this kid? And asked him to sit down and do the audition. You cheat. Are I you saying you. that I cheated? Yes. Can you prove I cheated? Yes, I saw it. You saw what? I saw you just put a hand in it. You cheat, Dr. Jones. You cheat. You Use mean? the full car. Oh, you say now. No mistake. No mistake. Mistake. I'm very little. You cheat very big. He was a real natural actor. 
he uh, believed what he did. He invested uh, emotionally in what he did. And I really enjoyed working with him. He was great fun. It's something you have to learn to do very easy. It looks like you're working real hard, right? But the, when you start, you can do it just like that. After the audition and, and they told me I got the part, then we got on a plane and went to Sri Lanka, which sort of uh, replaces uh, in India in the movie. And that's where the adventure begins. Of course it was set in India. I went to India first. We found all the locations. They were fairly well spread. But the one I liked best was the Amber Palace in Jaipur that we were going to use as the Maharaja's palace. I then began the negotiations with the Indian government, you know, for permission to do it. They have to vet the script and everything. And they began to ask for all these changes in the script. All scripts that are uh, made by foreign film companies have to be submitted to the government for approval. Indians are very sensitive about foreigners criticizing anything in their country. I rang George and told him, I said, look, I'm getting an awful lot of trouble out of the, the Indian government about the script. And when eventually, I'd said, I'd done everything and I discussed it with George. We'd set it in a little principality on the border of India, so it wasn't actually India, all this stuff. And, and in the end, they said, you can't use the word Maharaja. Well, I did it. I said, I've had enough of this. And I rang George and I said, I found everything in Sri Lanka apart from Maharaja's palace. They don't have them there. How about a nice couple of mat shots and we build the courtyard on the back lot. We're going to shoot the interior of the studio anyway. And he agreed. And then I took it to Steve and he agreed. And that's what we did. We built the village in Sri Lanka, uh, just outside of a, of a small town called Kandy right in the area where David Lean shot many scenes from The Bridge on the River Kwai. I'm such a film fanatic for certain kinds of movies that I just wanted to go near where he shot his great epic. All right, here we go. There was an actor who I believe was Singalese and uh, spoke Singalese, but didn't speak English at all, hardly at all. And he had his whole part had to be in English. And so what I had to do was, I've never, never done this before, I had to speak the English and he copied my English. So I actually would sit there and say to him, like monsoon, and he would say, like monsoon, and I would go, I would go, it, and I actually did this, I said, it, and it brings darkness. And I moved my hand across my eyes and he said, it brings darkness. What has happened here? The evil start in Bangkok, then like monsoon, it moves darkness. Old country. And that's basically how I got him to speak English. And the pauses were built in, so you have to imagine my voice to understand why there are so many pauses before his next line, because I'm trying to get my words in there for him to repeat after me. And it's somehow kind of in a kinky way, and thank God for Mike Kahn, my editor, he sort of made it all work in the cutting room. Putting that scene together for Steven, I had to find, I, it doesn't look that way, but I had to find the line that works and how to cut away for something, then go back for the next line that works, maybe overlap a line, because he had to feed him every line and keep refeeding him the lines. And that's the way the picture started. It was very difficult to make that work. Can you provide us with a guide to take us to Delhi? Yes, Sajnu will guide you. Come on, the elephant. Indiana, I cannot go all the way to Delhi like this. In Temple of Doom, we had elephants. And uh, of course, Sri Lanka had plenty of elephants. So we, they actually had an elephant orphanage where we went and we got some elephants and they were trained and brought up to our location. Good, good mount. That's the way to get on an elephant. Well, riding elephants looks like fun, but in fact you have to sit right astride the shoulder muscle, the, the, the muscles behind the back there. And it, you sit in a position where it kind of pulls you apart. And uh, I think that was the beginning of the herniation uh, in my back. It's fun. <laughs> this is so horrible to say. I didn't really read the script very carefully. I was probably too busy packing, getting passports, and I didn't know that there were snakes. And then someone said, there are snakes, because at the very end of three weeks in Sri Lanka, they're building this little pond, and you're going to be in the water, and a snake is going to come out of the tree. It's going to come down behind you while you're freshening up in this little pond. And I'm thinking, oh, I, oh, I, I really, I don't, I don't think I can do that. 
I think I may have articulated this to um, Frank Marshall, and it was his idea to go to the set where the snakes were going to be on the sand, and we were going to go and we were going to have a little visit with the snakes. And I went over and looked at it, and looking at it, I get tears in my eyes, and I. I, I'm having a hard time breathing and I'm looking, I could almost work myself up right now. And I went over and I put my hand on this snake and I, that, and I lost it. She was shaking and she was all white and uh, you could see right through her makeup, she, was, she had lost all of her color. And I said, I'm not gonna put you through this, let's cut it out. And I cut the whole scene out of the movie. I think she probably years and years later married me for that. I was so relieved and he said, but, you have got to do the bugs. Like, you know, a kid, right? Okay, you can't do this, but you have got to do. And I didn't know about the bugs. And I went, the what? And then as, as a kind of reward for me, we had this fake snake that she was gonna have over her neck. And she said, I wanna use the real snake. And this is like three, four weeks later, we're shooting at L Street on a soundstage. And she actually let that one snake come down around her neck go around here and she said, I said, I said, cut it out! And she got her hand around it, it was a living snake and she threw it. And I think that was her way of saying thank you for my cutting the other whole snake scene out of the picture. Ooh, what big birds! <laughs> Those aren't big birds, sweetheart. They're giant vampire bats. Those bats are their fruit bats, they're called. They're really big, uh, and they migrate at sunset. They move so that every day they'll fly over. This is just like the birds. It's like when they were all sitting around on the jungle gym. So those bats are real. They actually were there. And we basically put them in, and that line where Harrison says something like, those aren't birds, honey. They're giant vampire bats. They're not vampire bats. They're fruit bats. Vampire bats are really small. I'm Chatter Lal, Prime Minister to His Highness the Maharaja of Pankot. I had given up acting and left England, gone back to India, and then Attenborough pulled me out to do the Gandhi film. I did it. And in 1982, Gandhi had come out. People liked what I did in that. I did my beautiful laundrette in 84, and I think I had done that tiny role in Passage to India, which people remember. A very sort of cool, laid-back lawyer, you know, like that, who's bored by everything in Passage to India. I think that was it. And then Spielberg and Temple of Doom. There's still the expression of tremendous pressure and pain roll right. out towards us. So once again, once again. If you think of those movies from the 30s and Republic serials from the 30s, you know, they take themselves a little bit more serious. But at the same time, there's all these sort of Abbott and Costello movies and kind of Laurel and Hardy and sort of The Thin Man. There's all these kind of movies that are sort of upbeat, which is what we wanted to infuse in Raiders, in which I had done in Star Wars. And so there's this kind of goofy 30s humor going on through the whole thing. Ah, oh, sneak, surprise. And I think that scene at the dinner table does sort of capture that spirit. I mean, we did have a lot of fun discussing it because it was, oh, let's sit around just thinking the most horrible things you could think of, but it's done very tongue in cheek. I mean, that was something that I'd always want to put in a movie. And Steve sort of has a sense of humor that fits right into that. He loves practical jokes on people. And I know he used to do a lot of that with his sisters. He used to, you know throw spiders at him and things like that that all boys do, but he really still loves to, you know, make creepy crawly things and have everybody go, oh my God. I, I said, what about a meal of the worst stuff you would never imagine eating as long as you would live? You know, like eating eels and eating bugs and eating brains from monkeys. I think in a way, by doing a kind of dark version of the Indiana Jones series, it gave permission to poke some fun at ourselves and have a scene that was really, you know, toward gross-out comedy. So we had rubber bugs with, you know, don't worry, when you watch the movie, inside of bugs is custard. And inside the monkey brains was custard with raspberry sauce. Uh, do you have anything simple, like soup? And also inside the soup was just rubber eyes that had these little stick stickums, and you could, you, each eye stuck, and Kate was told that she had to really stir the pot to get the eyes to come unglued from the bottom of the pot to float to the surface. 
which was hard to do. Most of the takes, only one eye came up. I step on something. Yeah, there's something on the ground. In sitting around with Gloria and Bill and George knocking out the story, we were trying to think, okay, what's worse than snakes? What can we do in the follow-up of Raiders of the Lost Ark, now a globally known movie? What can we do that won't let the audience down? And I don't know whose idea it was, but somebody said bugs. And so I said, yeah, great. We'll get millions of bugs. As long as I don't move, I'm okay. Frozen in position. Stop breathing. It's a flying uh, scorpion. Yeah, great. I became the bugmeister, and uh, I found a guy in England who did bugs. That one's on my neck. Can we get that one off my neck? So we created this whole really disgusting bug uh, hotel where we kept the bugs and uh, we had all sizes and varieties and Kate Capshaw was not acting when we were dropping the bugs on her. They made me do the most awful things. I have to play with bugs. Get in the set and do the bugs. No. Do the bugs. No. Do the bugs. No. She promised me when she wouldn't do the snake, she'd do the bugs. Okay, I'll do the bugs. Do the bugs. I was really asking people, is there a pill? There must be something I can take to keep myself from freaking out because uh, I don't want everyone to look at the movie and go, oh, she's on drugs. Uh, but I did take something um, that was like a relaxant and I came to the set. I was like, hi, Stephen. He goes, hi. I go, and he said, we're going to do the bugs. And I go, okay. He said, well, I'm going to come, you know, I'll stand with you. And I went, okay. He said, they stand here, we're going to pour some, bu some bugs on top of you. All right. Where will they be coming from? Well, we're going to pour a bunch of buckets of bugs from up above you, and they're going to just come down onto you, and it's going to be several buckets. Okay. Cut, 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 cut. Okay, right you know, that's how it was the whole day. We got to take them off. Okay, we got to get Robert down here. We don't have enough bugs to make the scene work. We need 50,000. I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> I contributed the spike room concept from many of the serials that I had seen growing up as a kid, where there were rooms with spikes in them, and, and it was just a flagrant homage, so to speak, to those old Republic serials, and so I wanted that in the movie, and that was part of the story meeting very early on, and so when it came time to build it, I was so excited to watch that set be constructed. Elliot Scott was the production designer, and we wanted this ceiling coming down, but the spikes that start coming down in advance of the ceiling. So synchronizing that, we, we did that with um, electric hoists and we just timed it. And luckily for us, the electric hoists were just a perfect speed. And it was a diabolical scene because it was also raced against time. And I remember uh, that being one of the most enjoyable set pieces of that entire production of Temple of Doom for me to, to shoot and for Mike Khan to cut. We had the best time, especially since the little coda that I added at the end where after they finally come out and she leans over and her butt hits another device, and the whole thing starts over again. And that whole sequence is, I think, for me, as a director, is the most successful of all the set pieces in the movie. That, to me, is my favorite scene. The evil temple, it was huge. I mean, when I walked on the set for the first day, it looked like, it looked like an opera hall. It was, it was just one of the biggest sets that I had ever seen. And it was a great set, and Dougie did the most ingenious lighting. He lit the pit with a lot of nine lights, with a lot of red gel on it to give the fire effect coming up. Thanks for the cross light. Thanks for the hot light. Thanks for the dark faces and the hot back light and all that crazy stuff. Dougie, I think, did his most daring lighting on all those kind of darkly evil set pieces in Temple of Doom. I was lucky enough on, on the Indiana Jones trilogy to have t two great art directors, uh, Norman Reynolds on Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Elliot Scott on Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and also on The Last Crusade. The interesting thing about the sets, all three films seem to require fairly large interiors. We often had to use the largest stage in the studio. Quite a problem to light in a way, because they did need 
naturally an enormous amount of light. And the great thing about both those art directors is that they were very helpful and would ask them if they could cut certain sections in the rocks, the things that were supposed to be rocks, to enable me to hide lights, to illuminate the scene. So it did enable me to, to, to get the quality of light that I particularly wanted in there. Soon we will have all the five Shankara stones, and the Tuggies will be all powerful. Oh, that was 1984, and he's still more or less at the top of the villain heap. He's India's number one villain, certainly India's richest villain. As he comes in, she's looking. He had a good build even then. I think he was a wrestler. He didn't do weights and things, but he was a big guy even then. And he was bald for this. Do you know, he has never since had any hair. He shaved it like Yul Brenner ever since that film. As I start bringing it, I start speaking with him. Harrison had a back injury on Temple of Doom. During the shooting, Harrison's back herniated. When he was fighting with the uh, thuggy inside his suite in the Pancart Palace, he did that scene where guys got him around the neck, and Indy like flips his body back to knock the guy off, and that's where Harrison's back went. Man, he 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 let out a a call for help at that point that was such a knife wound, almost like a stab right through his spinal cord. Nothing that I tried, uh, therapy or um, drugs or icing or anything else seemed to, seemed to help. And I woke up one morning standing by the side of the bed and was unable to move either forward or get back in the bed. It took me 45 minutes to get back in bed. I was back here in the States, actually, when that happened, because I would go back and forth, and I got this call, and uh, Stephen said, Harrison is really in bad shape here, you know, and I don't know what to do about it. You know, he's really, they said he's working, you know, but he's really in pain, and, and I don't know how much longer this is going to last. So I said, okay, and I jumped on a plane, and I got there the next morning, and Harrison was in really terrible pain. He would be on the, on the set on a bed, and then they would sort of, lift him up and get him and he'd sort of walk through his things and they get him back on the bed and I said this we can't do this I said if we have to shut the picture down we'll shut the picture down so I just said get let's get an airplane let's fly Harrison to Los Angeles let's have this operation happen as soon as possible and we did quiet please uh, Harrison Ford uh, has a message for everybody here uh, <laughs> I've got some good news and I've got some bad news the good news is Harrison Ford is fine he feels great his enzyme papaya treatment worked fantastically well, and he's uh, doing exercises and getting back into shape. And the bad news is he needs until August 8th to get back into shape. Harrison had this very controversial papaya enzyme surgery performed on his back, thank God, successfully and permanently. And I was left in London for three weeks with a double. Stuntman Vic Armstrong. So I shot the whole fight on the big crusher on the conveyor belt with Vic Armstrong. That wasn't storyboard. That was pretty much shot. Like I shot the flying wing in the first Raiders, I just pretty much made it up as I went along. And Vic and I shot most of that scene. And then when Harrison came back six weeks later, I just plugged in Harrison's close-ups. It was a pretty remarkable recovery. I think pretty much based on the fact that I was in pretty good shape for the film to start with, and it helped a lot in my recovery. Ever since I was a little kid, I loved Jackie Chan movies. I always watch them, and I'll practice kicking my brother, my poor little brother. Uh, so it was fun doing those. Concentrate on spinning. Yeah. They did have a martial arts instructor on the set with me, uh, which coached me for a few hours. That's it, good one. Uh, other than that, um, you know, I just went out there and did it. Um, and, and it was pretty much, you know, from watching all those Jackie Chan movies. As we get into the mine car to make our escape, he had a stick, and they were made of balsa wood, which is nothing, feels like air, like styrofoam. And he hit the big guy, and when he hit the big guy, it broke in half, and the other half hit me right in the eye. It felt like a slap. And the next morning when I woke up, I had what no one would believe. It was like someone took black paint 
and then just did this to me. So when I turned up to the set the next morning, I came in just to block the scene, and the entire set had their black smudge. Uh, so we all had a black eye. All I do is come up like this, grab like this, Break and then it. take a, a rubber rock right, right. and boom! That's great, because here's what Pat will be doing. Pat will just be walking up the track, stalking you like this. I didn't do as many storyboards on Temple of Doom as I did on Raiders. Part of that was because I was not exactly secure with the story, and I had I had always had some problems with the darkness, and I wasn't. I, I thought maybe I should. Uh, I I, need, I needed to be more spontaneous to try to put more humor in where it needed humor. All the big set pieces I storyboarded, but some of the in-between action fights I just sort of left it to all of our first impressions, seeing the set for the first time and getting ideas and just figuring it out. Of course, certain scenes it goes without saying. Like the minecart chase was storyboarded because most of that was done by ILM back in the States, shooting all the miniatures. Elliot Scott had built this actual mine train and it had certain, you know, like a roller coaster, it had dips, it had little valleys, and it was, it was the circumference of the entire soundstage. Uh, it's a great reveal coming around the corner and suddenly seeing about 20 yards, 30 yards of track. And then, and then what we did to make it look like it was different, we just kept changing the lighting. One of the lucky things to happen to us was when we found our location in Sri Lanka, which was in a little village at about halfway in the middle of the country named Candy. Right up the road from Candy, a big British company was building a dam. So there was all of this equipment and expertise and engineers in this town. And one of the things that we needed was a suspension bridge. And we found this gorge that was up on the other side of the dam. And these engineers came and they designed this bridge for us. They built the bridge for us. And it was a very lucky situation for us because to bring the people in to do that would have been really cost prohibitive. Yeah, it's real scary. You mean we can cross here? Stephen was really, was really scared of the bridge uh, because it was a real suspension bridge uh, over, I guess it was 150 feet clear fall before you dashed yourself to death on rocks and shallow water. It's, it's very bouncy, Steve. Very bouncy. <laughs> it is. Boy, I'll tell you, you get out there, those guys. I have a terrible fear of heights. And when the bridge was finished, I could go out 40 yards from either end, but I couldn't go to the point of no return. Just couldn't do it. Harrison, in the meantime, said, oh, that's nothing, and he ran across the bridge. First time he got on the bridge, he ran as fast as he could from one end to the other. Couldn't believe he did that, but he's, that's Harrison Ford. Yes, he's Indiana Jones. Garrett Brown did the steady cam work, and Garrett's shaky. He hates the bridge as much as I do. Garrett won't go out 40 yards either. And I said, you're smart, Garrett. You and I are not going out 40 yards, so we stayed. And by the way, the bridge was the safest bridge you could possibly imagine, but I just couldn't look down, and so I kept most of my shots on either the first third or the last third and didn't go in the middle physically with a camera. Okay, that, that's the shot, Garrett. Hang on, lady, we go for a ride. Oh, my God. The moment on all the films that I think was the most crystallizing for all of us was the moment we cut the rent bridge on Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Ah! The bridge was strung on steel hawsers across this canyon. And for the bridge to cut, uh, George Gibbs, who was the special effects guy on that, had the whole thing rigged with some form of electrically detonated charges that had to cut four steel hawsers that were through that bridge. The thing was that we'd never tested them or had time to do any tests, so we just had to do it. And the bridge was rigged with all the dummies. For the first time ever, we had created dummies that, as they fell, they kicked. You know, nowadays with CGI, it, they cheat. We actually did it for real, and the dummies, if you look in the film, do kick as they fall, and they go like this. There was always this discussion who was going to make the dummies, and we were told there was somebody in America who specializes in dummies, and then I never heard anything, and we were ready to go to Sri Lanka in about six weeks' time. So I finally said to uh, Frank Marshall, I said, Frank, what's happening about the dummies, you know? He said, ah, oh, 
Oh, you make them. Why don't you make them? You know, just like that, you know. So now we had to work out a way to mass produce 14 mechanical dummies, you see. OK, any time, George. So we just went and bought mannequins, and we used them to make moulds. And then um, we just put crew mechanics in, and they just worked off ordinary flat batteries. George, that was great. Just great. And then we had a switch with a wedge in the switch, made of rubber. It was actually a doorstop. And we tied a string from that to the bridge. And then we set all the dummies up so that when they fell away, they pulled the wedges away from the switches. And then the dummies just started flinging their arms and legs in the air. It was an exciting sequence. Stephen wanted all the cameras he could get, so naturally the second unit worked with him. And George Lucas was on the set, and so that gave us another good man behind the camera. Well, so far, let's review the cameras. We've got Aerie with a 40. 40. We've got the Panastar going about 48 frames a second up there with maybe a 50. Right. We've got Garrett with Garrett the steady with cam, steady cam up there, and we'll shoot, that'd probably be a 75. So that's one, two, three cameras. We got one. One down there is four. is four. This division on the bridge is five. Five. Six will be on that side. And we have two more to play with. At that moment, every camera we had is pointed at the bridge from every angle that we possibly might need. And those are the moments where you stand, because I'm going, what if three of the horses goes and one doesn't? All right, here we go. The bridge had to fall in one shot, in one take, with eight cameras rolling on it and have it uh, work, which is always a terrifying moment when they go three, two, one, they hit the button, does it work? Action! And it went and it was perfect. Now those moments are like incredible because it's one go. If we'd blown it, I think it'd have had to be in some ILM fix, because I we could never have re-rigged it. It wasn't possible. <laughs> and then we go to England and continue shooting. And cut. All the shots looking up was in London with only a small bridge. And then the wall, we built a wall for all the stunt work when the bridge was hanging and they were trying to hand over hand to get to the top, that was just shot on it like a flat perspective, shaped like a mountain cliff. The third component was all the alligators. Frank Marshall took a second unit crew to Florida and shot the alligators. So it was shot on three different continents. Two down, one to go. That's right. Two one down, to go, the complete Two down, facility. one to go. We have one more of these to do. When the Temple of Doom came out, it ultimately did about as well as the first one. Even though it was dark, it sort of got hit by reviews and things because it was so dark, and, and uh, people sort of complained that, you know, it wasn't for kids. We did not get an R rating. We, in fact, got a PG rating. But it created a tremendous controversy, and people talked more about how inappropriate Temple of Doom was for younger children. And I felt there should be a rating in between PG and R. And so I called Jack Valenti, the head of the Motion Picture Association of America, the MPAA, and said, can't there be an in-between rating? And I actually said it could be like PG-14 or PG-13. And he said, let me get back to you. And the next thing I heard, Jack Valenti was able to institute, for the first time in many decades, a brand new rating. I think we went darker than any of us really wanted to go. But you're in the middle of it and you're doing things and it's, it's a matter of what you do every moment. And you don't realize what has happened until you put it all together and you see it as one piece. Because you do a little dark thing here and then you do a light thing and then you do another little dark thing and then you do another little dark thing and then pretty soon you put it together and you realize, uh-oh, it's darker than it is light. And this stuff is stronger than we thought of it as. But I, you know, I don't mind the film. We definitely wanted to make a different movie from, from Raiders. We didn't want to just do the same movie over again. But because this was supposed to be a different kind of movie than the first one, it was supposed to be a scary movie and more of a horror film, uh, you know, we were, we were really surprised. And I think the reaction of the critics was somewhat harsh. Here, hold this. <laughs> the other thing that they didn't like was the portrayal of the female. Where's my gun? Where's my gun? I burnt my fingers and I cracked a nail! So again, here I am, you know, college educated, master's degree, half of my doctorate. I'm a single mom. I'm 
you know, I am woman, hear me roar. I'm living the life of such a feminist. And here I am being, uh, not attacked, but I'm definitely being called on the carpet for creating this female that was, you know, stereotypically not a feminist with her fingernails and her this and her that and her whining and complaining and screaming. I couldn't have had more fun doing it. I'm afraid I just said, we're making an adventure movie. We're telling a tall tale. I was fairly well pleased with the final result. It certainly was a darker kind of story, but well worth it, I think, for the originality of that film uh, compared to what I think expectations were for it. It was a little bit more challenging than I think what people anticipated. Just as you'd launch, the guy takes a swing and misses. He said, great, he likes it. You know, of all the Raider indie films, Temple of Doom is my least favorite. I mean, I, I look back on Temple of Doom and I say, well, the greatest thing that I got out of that movie was I met Kate Capshaw and we were married years later. And that, to me, was the reason I think it was fated that I make Temple of Doom. And so even though Indiana Jones wound up getting the girl, I really did.